they see this reordering and they cannot see what will be the outcome of that. So they don't see the future. And that's a really crucial dimension of emptiness because it's kind of this undoing of things without replacement, without kind of clear sense of what's coming next. Thank you for watching this video. Please help us keep the show alive by liking and sharing this video and by subscribing to the show and making sure the notification button switched on. For those of you who can help a little bit more, there's a Patreon link down below where you can contribute wherever you can. Every little does help and all the money will go directly back into the show. You can also keep up with our latest content on Instagram at The No Show Pod, as you can see on the screen. As you know, The No Show is an initiative designed to make academic research accessible to everyone. So do contribute to the conversation, leave some questions, have a discussion, and I'll make sure I get back to everyone. So that's a thank you so much for joining me on The No Show. I'm really pleased to have you. Thank you for having me. Um, now, before we get into sort of the, the ins and outs of, of your research, um, which I find uh, to be incredibly interesting because it looks at, you know, a, a metaphor that many people use on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but before we get into that, let us start sort of talking about you and, and, and your journey. So how, how did you find yourself becoming an anthropologist looking at, you know, all sorts of concepts? <laughs> <laughs> That's an excellent question. Actually, I first encountered anthropology as an undergraduate in the United States. Uh, this was in the 1990s. I had just freshly left the so what was then the Soviet Union at the age of 18 and uh, had never heard of anthropology before and uh, really was influenced by an anthropology professor that I had. His name was Basa uh, Abed. He was a Palestinian origin. And he just simply swept me away by the way that anthropology was able to look at uh, various, you know, why people did the things that they did, uh, how power worked um, and all sorts of things like that. Um, and then I returned to Latvia, worked for the United Nations, United Nations Development Program for five years and became extremely disillusioned with the, how the UN worked. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in anthropology helped me kind of see the power relations that shape the development apparatus and how it operates sort of throughout the world. And that really drove me again back to anthropology. So I went back to the States and continued my education in anthropology. It's very interesting that you, you, your journey involved sort of like involved, not just a, a theoretical aspect, but really a practitioner in, in sort of development, which is like a huge part of anthropology. So, yeah. you, you know, you said you were disillusioned. What, what kind of things like contributed to that? To the disillusion? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think this is I mean, well also described in various uh, anthropology works since then. But as a practitioner back then, I was, um, uh, I, I noticed how uh, the United Nations Development Program relied on global consultants that uh, came to various locations to write poverty eradication programs or other types of programs. They spend relatively little time in these places. Um, and came up with very influential programs. And, and, and sort of, to some extent, these were standardized uh, programs that didn't necessarily perhaps correspond to the local conditions. And this is not sort of because the people were bad in any way, but because that's how the system worked. So that was, that was one way in which I was kind of disillusioned. And the other one was actually the kind of internal hierarchies between international and local staff that the UN system uh, you know, runs on that uh, it's this this kind of uh, yeah. So those were to me. I just it sort of felt them uh, then as 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 uh, as somehow unjust. <laughs> of course, and and you know you you're I mean surprisingly you're you're not the first to to uh, you know express this and and you know I, I've I've spoken to academics who've worked in the UN as well. But not just for, so they're not they're not looking at it from an anthropological lens. They're looking at it from all sorts of lenses, and mm -hmm. you know it seems to be um, this generic top-down approach that is, you know, so far away, so far removed from reality. You know, like you you create a model and then you just 
plonk it on top of these people and accept, uh, expect them to just get on with it. And so how much do you think like the role of an, an, an anthropologist can really educate and, and inform the, you know, organizations like the UN about how they're doing things? Uh, I think this is already happening. And um, I mean, this is, uh, there is the kind of disjuncture between on the one hand, local um, practices, which actually, when we look at the specific uh, all kinds of locations around the world, you might find that in, in, in on the ground, uh, the UN staff and anthropologists work well together and invent all kinds of uh, locally appropriate uh, projects and programs. But the UN is a huge machinery and the UNDP as well. And so they it comes with all kinds of bureaucratic and institutionalized measures, which, which kind of by definition try to standardize they do mm. not necessarily perhaps allow for um, for kind of ideological breakthroughs uh, and again many anthropologists have also written that these systems are flexible you know they do take on critique and change and if we look at the world bank for example and the kind of world bank understandings of development since the 90s you know we've gone through several different paradigms of development precisely in response to critique from sort of the, the ground up, you know, mm -hmm. it was first, it was development, then it was sustainable development, then it was development with a human face and so forth and so on. And, and this is, I mean, what you're describing there is like a, a change in the system or a reordering of this, of the system, which, you know, leads us swiftly into, into one of what one threads of your research, which is um, on emptiness and, you know, you you have really interesting ideas on emptiness um very very interesting concepts um that I, I'd, I'd like for you to share but before i do what do you define as emptiness mm -hmm. but or what did you define as emptiness before you yeah. go into this <laughs> so i what i what i understood when i heard people uh, use the term emptiness I, I, uh, they always qualified it, of course, because, you know, they say this is it's all empty, uh, but then it requires qualification. So immediately it's clear that emptiness is not nothing, that it kind of has some kind of material manifestation. So then people would point to empty apartment buildings, empty houses, then would tell how many people have left the area they live in. They would complain about cancellation of bus uh, um, routes. Uh, and things like that. So suddenly emptiness started taking on material uh, kind of presence. Um, and then I started defining it. So my kind of working definition is, <laughs> is that it consists of at least three dimensions. One is the material reality where places kind of lose their constitutive element. You know, if a place consisted of a school, uh, you know, a certain group of people, something else, then slowly these elements are disappearing. So that's one dimension of emptiness. Second is that social relations change. If you had a lot of people and you had uh, doctors, um, teachers and so forth, as these people disappear, other types of relations have to take their place. So for example, the postal worker in these emptying places is working almost like a social worker. The postal person is bringing medicines to people, milk, bread, sometimes vodka if, if you know, if someone <laughs> wants it. Um, and then third, it's a meaning, system of meaning, because people are using some kind of uh, imaginations of, of what is happening, right, to kind of give them, name them. They're using this term emptiness to name this quite radical change that they see around them. But and one important dimension, sorry, just to add, ahead, yeah. is that they see this reordering and they cannot see what will be the outcome of that. So they don't see the future. And that's a really crucial dimension of emptiness because it's kind of this undoing of things without replacement, without kind of clear sense of what's coming next. It, I mean, th this is something that I think resonates to a lot of people. In fact, I would perhaps even argue it resonates to everyone because just in, in the, the natural progression of life, things change. And, you know, like, you know, I come from, I obviously come from a, a, a an immigrant background into the UK. When we came to, to, to London and we, you know, lived in London, there were certain areas that were all white areas mm -hmm. that are now like very, very mixed. And we would hear, you know, even as, as recent as a couple of months ago, I would hear people in conversation talking about, oh, you know, 
you know, all all my friends have left, you know, like all, you know, the, the people who were formerly of those areas who were mostly working class white people, um, people would say it's everyone's left, all the pubs mm-hmm. have changed, all the you know, such and such. And obviously sometimes it'll be a bit derogatory and, and racist. But, yeah, absolutely. But but the 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 fact that this is a normal, you know, I, I mean, in my eyes, it's a normal part of life where things have to change and there's reordering. Um, so so it, on on that sort of point, is it, you know, is this concept of emptiness something that you know relates to the human being or does it relate to uh, like a collective? Is it a, is it a unique mm-hmm. thing or is it a collective thing? This is actually, I mean, could I reply in two parts? One about sort of what you said about the areas of London. I mean, you're absolutely right because often emptiness is in the eye of the observer. What seems uh, empty is seems uh, the places that seem empty simply don't have the elements that you want to see there. Mm-hmm. And the absence of the, what's familiar to you makes this place look empty, even though it is not actually empty, right, in any kind of uh, uh, absolute way. Now, the difference between what I'm seeing in Eastern Latvia and what you're talking about is that actually, so what's coming in, let's say these people that have been living there are losing familiar elements, mm-hmm. their friends, their families, their schools. What's coming in is the following uh, wilderness. So there's nature taking over uh, what formerly residential buildings. There are um, formerly th- cultivated fields turned into forested areas because of kind of extractive industries. There maybe are some former uh, kind of residential places even turned into industrial agriculture, kind of agro holdings. So we're not talking uh, kind of just, uh, not, kind of, not just, but we're not talking about different people coming in and those people seeming empty from the perspective of the former residents, mm. which is, you know, actually does happen. I think you're right to sort of say that this metaphor is used to talk about changing social milieu. What I'm sort of seeing is that these places are actually expelled from, from kind of circuits of people, capital and the state. They become really kind of abandoned in, in that way. Um, and again, you could have someone, for example, a degrowth promoter, you could say this is excellent. You know, the Soviet modernity over industrialized these areas. Now they're uh, deindustrialized, so there are fewer people. Nature is returning. This is good for the global environment. I guess you could, you know, you could imagine mm-hmm. someone saying that as well. So I'm looking at that as well. I mean, what kind of alternative interpretations are present? Um, but what's interesting in the case of Latvia as well is so you mentioned migration is that actually uh, the few, let's say, immigrants, uh, refugees that are, have come into Latvia that have been allowed to come into Latvia by the current government have all wanted to uh, move on further to Germany mm. or Sweden or elsewhere. So this says something about the location that I'm looking at in the imagination of, of kind of in the global hierarchy of places. This mm-hmm. is not a place that you want to go to necessarily, whereas London, of course, is in that sense, a global city that kind of attracts people, even though it has these kind of pockets that people refer to as empty. And I suppose, you know, for people that aren't familiar with with Latvia, would it be fair to describe, you know, the emptying situation similar to what happened in Detroit after the the collapse of what was Mm. once upon a time the motor city of the world and you know, when all that collapsed. Yeah, there are, of course, resonances, but Detroit was a huge industrial center, of course. Latvia was not in that sense. Uh, Industries where uh, it was industrialized, of course, there were factories and and collective farms and a very sort of Soviet type of industrialization. And in places, indeed, you know, you had factories closed and, and there are some few, but some locations where they kind of on a much smaller scale could be compared to Detroit. But they could also, for example, be compared to places like Blackpool in the UK, which Mm -hmm. was a vacation spot for uh, the working people in the north. And with the kind of opening of global possibilities for travel, uh, that changed. Uh, A lot of people started going to Spain to vacation. So it has a lot to do with how particular places are integrated into kind of global flows of people and capital. 
Um, and if you go to Blackpool now, I, I, you, I've heard also all kinds of uh, podcasts and, and uh, writings about the future of Blackpool and, and the kind of, uh, you know, not a very uh, complimentary, I suppose, references to Blackpool as the place where people go to be poor. Because mm -hmm. in a way, that's kind of, because housing is cheap and in the former hotels, you have people sort of settle because they, nobody's asking them to sign rental contracts. Mm -hmm. So there are, I would say these places are resonant, but these processes look slightly differently, of course, there because of their particular histories and social um, reality. So has, has, you know, Latvia, has this sort of entry into Europe been a, um, been, I guess, an Im like uh, one of the reasons or one of the contributors to this emptiness that's happening in Latvia? Uh, of course. Um, and again, it's not doesn't necessarily mean that it's therefore automatically good or bad. That evaluation of course, depends on, on, on your class position, on, on your you know, uh, place in society. But certainly uh, it's related. It's related to the fact that the labor market uh, became bigger, <laughs> that people could go to the UK and many did went to various jobs in the UK and Germany elsewhere, which paid much more. And actually the initial years of joining the European Union, um, UK, Sweden um, and Ireland were the, the, the only three countries that actually uh, didn't put restrictions on labor mobility. Others did, whereas flow of capital to Latvia and other places in Eastern Europe wasn't limited. So for example, while, um, uh, Latvia's residents went to work in Boston, Lincolnshire, they didn't have any capital, they just didn't have money to buy things with, such as land. Uh, people who had accumulated capital, such as Danish farmers, for example, could come in and, um, and sort of start uh, cultivating land. I mean, they weren't in initially allowed to own land, but uh, if you really want to, you can find ways around these things, right? So, um, yeah, so it, so certainly this this was uh, this was uh, a factor for sure, and and that sort of takes us uh, on uh, to your book, the School of Europeanness, um, which really speaks to the post-Soviet Union um, Eastern Bloc and and what happened. Sort of, what was what their their mindsets became following you know the the, the departure from that's that world because it was a completely different world to th this new world of of um capitalism so uh, talk to us a little bit about that that transition for people what what was that transition like it's yeah it's um I mean, you could say that in a way it was a total social transformation <laughs> that people had to adapt to um a lot of new things and, and that sort of goes a little bit back to what we discussed in the context of my working for the UN as a kind of a fully grown uh, human at the time when this started happening. I was 18, 19 and then returned from my US sort of uh, uh, being in the US and studying in the US returned in mid 90s. I was really uh, struck by how the various consultants, including U UN consultants, but also various European Union advisors and you name it, kind of the international community, really came in often with the perception that people who had grown up in the Soviet Union were deeply lacking in their ability to think critically, in their ability to orient in the world. And yes, okay, I could not open a can when I went to the US because I didn't know how these different cans are made, you know, and I felt incredibly inadequate at the time. But this is far from saying that I had no critical thinking abilities because I had grown up in the Soviet Union. So a lot of people actually took offense, at least my generation, that they were sort of perceived almost as somehow inadequate. Um, and that then shaped their relationship to the various actually um, uh, programs, recommendations, requirements that came their way. And of course, the economic transformation was the, was the most radical. Uh, it was often referred to as shock therapy, perhaps uh, that concept, I don't know if you've heard or not, but, uh, but the sort of real kind of radical liberalization of the economy, privatization of public assets, that was done very rapidly, very fast, 
dispossessing just huge numbers of people. So it was really a shock. <laughs> And it was a very opportunistic too. I mean, must add, it was very incredibly opportunistic because, I mean, you know, like for, for somebody, like my background is in, in economics and, you know, I looked at development economics in, in Eastern Europe as a, mm-hmm. I, I was really interested in it, um, especially in the post-Cold War era and, and the transition. And one of the things that I found really fascinating was, uh, you know, it was through the eyes of, like industrialists and capitalists who who were in in the west and the us and and, and london pre- predominantly it was it was a land grab it was it, it was you know a, a juicy bit of capital to buy into um and and to me i can't help but notice that the way in which you're describing you know these external consultants come in and you know create this structure and whatever i can't help but notice there's this air of colonialism in it you know like it's almost as if like you guys are backwards and we're here to like rescue you we're here to we're here and and there was no sort of looking at the the individual and looking at you know their experience and like you just described that there's a feeling of inadequateness and do you feel like that generation and and obviously that is gets passed down this feeling of inadequateness do you feel like that needs to be unlearned in people it's interesting um i mean as as i guess in colonial context as well it's never sort of quite as straightforward there you always have people who actually kind of welcome it and who can move up the ladder career ladder that way and you know, there's always the kind of conflict between national elites in the post-colonial context and, and, and the kind of the, the people. So it's, it was all there. It was a kind of a mixed and complex situation with some people embracing it, others not. And, um, and again, uh, you know, you could sort of say that people, uh, for example, the external aid in often in the form of NGOs like the Soros Foundation actually single-handedly probably saved the social sciences from just completely disappearing because there was no money for social science. Mm. So again, there, it's a mixed bag. So on the yeah, one hand, you have to implement these kind of very standardized programs. On the other hand, you can actually survive as a social scientist. Otherwise, you would have become a victim to this sort of neoliberal, you know, reforms. Um, but uh, this neo-colonial situation, you also, of course, uh, there's some resonances, but we also have to recognize that uh, the kind of the, this class of oligarchs that emerged, that there were, of course, local kind of uh, former, you know, Soviet sort of apparatchiks or elites that took also quite a uh, you know, that kind of uh, a big chunk of that uh, capital that was available in the form of privatizing various, you know, um, production facilities and so forth. So in a way, there was a bit of competition between the sort of foreign capital and this kind of the local oligarchs, you know, that were emerging at the time. And some of the political struggles are kind of almost like a a manifestation of that. Mm -hmm. That that is uh, that, you know, I was told... uh, uh, um, there was quite a lot of resistance to the Danish farmers buying land. Um, lots of what looked like popular resistance on the ground. People said the foreigners are coming in, they're buying our land. And then I talked to sort of uh, in the process of interviewing the farmers, but also investment specialists and so forth. I interviewed a high level kind of investment advisor who told me that actually this kind of counter politics was very much fueled by a local oligarchs who wanted to compete with the uh, with the with the Danes, you know, for for the kind of the best <laughs> the best land. So there's always a kind of a mix of of interests and and kind of fueling of of various uh, political uh, movements that you need to really kind of look into to see. And and of course, there's there's always there's always more to the story. Um, uh, one of the things that uh, I found really interesting in your research was um, where you look at the concept of tolerance um, and there's a really interesting part where you describe tolerance as sometimes being action, sometimes being like tolerance towards action or tolerance towards a person. Now, this is a really interesting um, sort of dichotomy. Can you give us a bit bit of an explanation? Yeah. um... 
I first sort of started seeing it that way when, when I encountered kind of confusion and uh, lack of understanding uh, among uh, Latvia's residents, some of those who were being targeted by these tolerance promotion programs, they tried to get their head around what tolerance was. First, they said, is tolerance really a good thing? I mean, that just means basically putting up with something. It's not really kind of a, a very nice sort of uh, uh, register on which to think about living with someone. Um, but they thought about tolerance as, um, as something that, uh, as the object of tolerance as being action, as, as something that people do. So you can tolerate action or you can become intolerant when someone behaves in a kind of an appropriate way. Whereas this tolerance as liberal political virtue that was being proposed as part of these tolerance promotion programs in mid 2000s really was about categories of difference. They, these programs required that people change their understanding of and relationship to groups of people um, uh, identified by racial, ethnic or religious or other criteria. And that to many was confusing. How can you tolerate a person or a group uh, rather than uh, what, what they do? Um, and so I started, um, and you can, I mean, some of these arguments, you know, initially people really thought so, but then when you kind of, when, um, when a political juxtaposition emerges, then people start deploying these arguments for various kinds of other reasons, you know, mm -hmm. so you always have to look at who is saying this, why, in what context, and, and so forth and so on. But there is this distinction, and I also have... Um, then uh, read a, a really interesting article by political theorist Kirsty McClure um, that was already uh, written in 1995 that traces the kind of genealogy of tolerance uh, from early liberals like John Locke and so forth and so on, when it was also about practice, when it was about things like, you know, uh, wearing certain garb, uh, clothes, you know, Protestant uh, Catholic conflicts. Um, does it really matter? Does it make a difference for you that uh, someone comes into the church in a differently dressed, you know? Uh, if it doesn't, if it doesn't harm your person or your property, then be tolerant towards it. So it was about action. But then at some point, uh, it because it, it uh, in the kind of historically became attached to person to identity rather than to action, and I think we kind of need to perhaps go back to <laughs> to thinking about action rather than about person, and also about whether tolerance actually is. Uh, Wendy Brown, another political theorist, has written quite interestingly about it that it is really kind of um this idiom of tolerance assumes that there is the subject who tolerates, and then there is the object of their tolerance or intolerance. So it's inevitably a hierarchical kind of a relationship that someone extends tolerance. This is incredibly powerful. This is so, so powerful because, you know, when you, the, 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 you know, tolerance gets thrown around all the time, you know, uh, as a word. And, and you know, it's, we almost take, accept it as part of, of the fabric of society, um, especially if you, like, like you mentioned, if you hear, Certain politicians speak in the media propelling this this term even more tolerance to this tolerance to that you know especially when that like following certain events um you know ISIS and that sort of stuff there was a lot of terminology of tolerance Islamic tolerance tolerance to this tolerance to that and it was always focused on on groups of people. Now, when you're saying that you transition that, in, uh, you know, when you when you're saying tolerance, when you think of it like that, it's a hierarchy. It's actually mm -hmm. obvious, you know, but it's it's obvious after the fact that you've told it. Before that, you don't think it that way. You just think tolerance. You know, growing up and you just listening to tolerance, tolerance you you think I have to tolerate others, like mm -hmm. I'm in the position of power and I must tolerate. And this approach really teaches you know like i guess th this approach is it is it fair to say that this approach propels inequality as opposed to uh, or it, it exacerbates inequality as opposed to you know improving it um uh, I would say that certainly in some contexts, because in a way that if you really truly kind of think about 
equal coexistence, cohabitation or conviviality on as, as a very kind of popular term and used in, especially in, around the Mediterranean and in, in Spain, and but elsewhere. Those are different idioms for thinking about living together or solidarity, for example, or other types of things. Um, so I think tolerance is almost, I mean, it's, it's a fine social virtue when you're living with your neighbor and, you know, and, and, and uh, I don't know, they are, um, spraying some kind of smelly pesticide on their plants, you know, and you think, okay, I don't like this smell, you know, but they're good neighbors. Let me put up with this. Let me tolerate this, you know, action that they're doing. Um, but as soon as it enters into the political domain, as soon as it is thought of as a political um, attitude for thinking about cohabiting with others in public space, it changes. It changes into this hierarchical um, thing that assumes that there is a kind of a proper subject of public space that is in the position to tolerate um, others. And, and, and it's, it's, it's this use of language that is fascinating to me because, you know, yeah, I don't, maybe I'm wrong, but and, and if I'm wrong, please correct me. But, <laughs> you know, like, I see that this lends itself very well to concepts that we we get, you know, bombard us in the news and in media and things like that one of the concepts is british muslims or mm -hmm. britishness in muslims Brit like this concept of like us brits have to tolerate you as muslims so you have to become british muslims and there is an air of tolerance there in it um mm -hmm. so do you think this this use of language um do you think is 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 changeable or is it fixed now? Because I think, it, you know, the, those in power are using it to their advantage. So do you think mm -hmm. it, it's an evolution of language that now tolerance is only used to describe people? I think, well, I mean, it could be uh, sort of uh, <laughs> suffered. It, it could be said to have suffered this <laughs> Uh, uh, faith, but it doesn't mean that uh, a different language cannot emerge and be actively used. Mm -hmm. and, and another thing about tolerance is that it really, it's sort of, it's about attitude change. It doesn't really ask you to look at the fundamental structure of the polity of, uh, of you know, how, uh, of how kind of the basic elements are arranged in relation to each other and, and how people are positioned in public space. It's sort of, it's, it's, it allows you to adjust attitude, but not think about kind of the fundamental structures of inequality. And then, and, for, and if you are someone, uh, you know, who, who wants to think about them, then you're probably best off to sort of shedding, shedding the language of tolerance and thinking about other language that might be more appropriate for getting at the things you want to look at. What advice would you give to um, young anthropologists looking into, you know, get, getting into anthropology and particularly looking at, you know, unique concepts like the way that you're looking at these concepts what advice would you give them i guess slow thinking <laughs> i mean something is that it's 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 as you say that for example concepts like tolerance are thrown about uh, they've almost become kind of uh, uh, you know a natural kind of presence and it seems like it cannot possibly but be good Right, because mm -hmm. it's 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 what we want, and then and it requires some pause and 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 some sort of slow thinking and 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 really analysis of what actually is being done in the name of these concepts, how they have changed historically, who is using them, and how, and so forth and so on. So it's a bit of kind of a it's sort of almost like bracketing the moral frameworks that go along with these concepts and trying to think a bit critically about them and not assume that they're immediately good or bad and kind of examine, you know, who says that they're good and bad and, and how they have kind of emerged as these dominant ways of understanding, you know, what good politics is or what ethical relationship to others is and, and where, importantly, where this ethical relationship to others occurs. Because right now, I think we're in a situation where it seems that 
to be ethical, one has to be public. In other words, people mm. debate all kinds of things publicly on Twitter, you know, sort of say, okay, you said this, you're a bad person, I don't know what, I mean, all kinds of things are happening publicly on Twitter. But what's happening actually in actual relationships between people, uh, we almost forget to pay attention about that to people's, you know, lives and life's trajectories and actual relationships and just kind of focus on language in public sphere. So we have to return to actually looking at practices and not just analyzing language, which is what we, I think, have been doing recently. Uh, that, I think that's, I think that's, that's golden advice. And, and, you know, it's very easy to fall into that trap of, of looking at language only. And I guess it's down to you anthropologists to, to, to bring us back to, back to behavior and looking at how people... <laughs> yeah. But it's also, I mean, people actually, I, I, that's, it's also, it's, it's, it's basically, you need organic intellectuals, as Gramsci would say, who can connect to the critical uh, potential that's already out there in the public domain in, in kind of, you know, pe- networks uh, of people. Uh, absolutely. And, and this is, I mean, uh, this is, I, I've said it once already and, and I can't, you know, help but emphasize it. I think your work is absolutely fascinating. I think, you know, audience listening to, to, to this podcast or to this episode should definitely check it out, check out the book, check out the, the research because there is such a unique and, and refreshing um, element to this research that, um, you know, brings you back down to questioning things such as tolerance, things like, you know, what is emptiness and, and understand how people are, are responding to certain things. So I think your work is absolutely Amazing. Um, where can people I- engage um, and find you online? Um, thank you very much for, for, your, for your really kind words uh, and for the really interesting <laughs> questions. I was really enjoying this conversation. I have a website called emptiness.eu, which has all the um, kind of information about the uh, emptiness project. And we publish blogs there. I have a team that's working in Russia, Ukraine, um, and uh, Eastern Germany as well. So emptiness.eu is where you go for emptiness. Um, on, uh, on liberalism, it's my webpage on the University of Oxford site, but also people can write to me and I can send chapters if uh, people are interested to read parts of the book. It's available on various online sites. Uh, university libraries probably but if people don't have access to it and wish to read it i'm happy to share parts of it sure uh, are you on twitter by any chance yes uh, uh it's at that so at my uh, yeah. name and last name uh, well, mm-hmm. um, okay yeah so that's a thank you so much for joining me I've, I've really enjoyed this conversation and i hope to have you on for your next bit of research <laughs> thank you so much for thanks for having me thank you for watching this video Please help us keep the show alive by liking and sharing this video and by subscribing to the show and making sure the notification button switched on. For those of you who can help a little bit more, there's a Patreon link down below where you can contribute whatever you can. Every little does help and all the money will go directly back into the show. You can also keep up with our latest content on Instagram at The No Show Pod, as you can see on the screen. As you know, The No Show is an initiative designed to make academic research accessible to everyone. So do contribute to the conversation, leave some questions, have a discussion, and I'll make sure I get back to everyone.